now, this year, uh, uh, I think in, in CCC, uh, your, your theme is uh, a better covenant, a better covenant. Um, and, uh, and so that is what is guiding uh, this church and, and things will be taught on that. In ICGC, our theme for this year is God. Uh, and so uh, this year I'm focusing on teaching on God and, and things related to God, uh, who he is and so on and so forth. So uh, since I feel that I'm an associate pastor here, I will, I will uh, teach briefly on the theme for our year, which is God. And so I'm, my title basically is God today. Uh, and, uh, and, and somebody will say, oh, but why do you have to teach about God? We know God already. Um, but the question you have to ask yourself is, which God do I know? Which God do I know? Because there are many gods. Which one do I know? When I say I'm praying to God, which one? Do I really know the God I am praying to? Uh, you, you know that in the Old Testament, uh, you read the Old Testament and you see that they knew that there were different gods. So when God called Abraham, um, he showed himself to Abraham and, and told Abraham to, to reveal what he had learned to the people. So Abraham started teaching about God. And so to distinguish what Abraham was teaching from what other people were teaching, uh, the God that Abraham was teaching about was called the God of Abraham. Now, people sometimes think when they say the God of Abraham, uh, it, it, it means, uh, uh, you know, Abraham had a personal God. No, it, it simply means this is the God Abraham knew. Uh, and and late, it's because he was the only one who knew this God. Abraham was the only one who knew him. And then Abraham taught his son Isaac. So he became the God of Isaac too. And then Isaac taught Jacob about this God of Abraham. So he became Jacob's God. Uh, and so we call him the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, and, and then later on, this knowledge went beyond the tribe, went beyond Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and went to the nation of Israel. So you'll find he was not called much the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When Israel became a nation, he was called the God of Israel. Because at that time, only Israel knew this particular God. And, and then uh, in the New Testament, he's the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and the God that we believe in as Christians. But this journey goes way back. Now, sometimes if you don't have this basic understanding, people think that it is a sign of spirituality to say the God of Otterville. Uh, and these days you cannot say that. You cannot say the God of Pastor Ransford or the God of Otterville or the God of any pastor because the God is no longer known by only a few people. He's known now by a lot of people. My God is your God. My God is not different from your God as a Christian. But the Christian God is not the same God as every other God that people worship. And, and so uh, we will talk a bit about that uh, today. So let me start with Romans chapter 1 verse 20. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Uh, it's one of my, you know, many times I preach, I say it's one of my favorite verses. Now, I, know, I don't even know which is my favorite verse. But it's one of those verses I really like in the Bible. Because it gives us a foundation for understanding God. Uh, and it says, for since the creation of the world, the invisible attitude, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So what the passage is saying briefly is that through creation, 
God revealed himself. And, and, and then it also says that God is invisible. Because if God is invisible, how are we going to know him? We cannot see him. How are we going to know him? And, and the passage says, through his creation, he showed us himself. And so when we read the Bible and we read about creation, we are also reading about the revelation of God. It is God saying, this is me and this is how I am. How do we know? By the way he revealed himself in creation. Are you, are you following that? So we go to my main text for today, which is the first verse in the Bible. The first verse in the Bible, which is, I believe, is the most important verse in the Bible. There are many verses in the Bible, many chapters in the Bible, many books in the Bible, many words in the Bible, but the most important verse, sentence in the Bible is this one. Because if this one is not there, nothing else exists in the Bible. Everything in the Bible is based on this sentence. And, 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 and understanding Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 is critical to understanding God. So I'm just going to stay today with Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and what it is teaching us about God. Let's read it together. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's read it together. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And there are many things I can say, but the first thing I can say, I want to say about this verse, is that it reveals that before the heavens and the earth, there was God. Before the heavens and the earth, there is God. Now, it may seem like a very simple statement, but it's very difficult. Because it tells us that God is eternal. God is eternal. He has always been, he will always be. He is uncreated. He is unmoved. He is eternal. So the Bible is saying that before there was time, before there was atom, before there was matter, before there was substance, before anything could be, there was God. The earth, the heavens were created by God. What kind of God? The eternal God. The eternal God. Other words for eternal is everlasting. We say God is everlasting. We say God is forever. We say God is endless. We say God is infinite. It is very difficult to think of anything as everlasting, forever, infinite, and eternal. Because there is nothing like that. Everything we know has a beginning and has an end. Even if it has not ended, it will end. Everything has a beginning and an end. Even we human beings have a beginning and an end. I read or I watched a documentary about some of the oldest things in the world. And uh, they, they said most of, you know, some of them were trees and, and some of them were uh, ferns and fungus and, and all kinds of things, uh, plants. And some of them have, have, uh, as, are supposed to have been 300 years and some are 1,000 years. And, and there are some which are about 70,000 years and, and some uh, go 
way back. And, and, and when, you, when you see a tree that has been there for a very long time, you may say that this tree has been there forever. But it has not been there forever. Somebody planted it. And one day somebody will cut it down. They said the oldest animal is, is, a, is a, a, gel, a jellyfish that lives somewhere in the, in the bottom of the ocean. And uh, it was said about this jellyfish that it renews its life. So it doesn't die. So when it's growing, get, getting old, it renews its life and it's there and it's there and it's there. And because it doesn't have many natural enemies wherever it is, it lives for a very long time. Now you can say something like that is forever. But one day if a fisherman catches it and fries it, it will not be forever. It will no longer be forever. But God cannot be caught and he cannot be fried. When we say God is eternal, it means there is no possibility ever any time for God's life to end. He is endless. He is infinite. There is no beginning to him. There is no end to him. And when we say that God is infinite, it means that God is the, has no, nothing to become. Do you understand? Nothing to become. God is. So God does not improve. God does not learn. God does not become better. Everything learns and improves, but God does not learn. God does not change. God does not become better. So, God, there is no love beyond the love of God. So, there is no love that God can say, oh, I love people, but I think if I can love them more, it will be better. There is nothing more because he has filled up everything that is and there can be nothing beyond what he is. His love is absolute and perfect. His grace is absolute and perfect. His goodness is absolute and perfect. God cannot be better than himself. Are, are you, are you, and that's why God doesn't, God doesn't learn. There's nothing you do that will make God say, ah, hmm, I didn't know human beings were this bad. Now I've learned, I have to change my ways and become, no, 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 God, God cannot do that. Because if he becomes that, then he's no longer God. He doesn't improve. Doesn't change his mind. He's always who he is. Now I know people will say, pastor, are you really sure God doesn't change his mind? You know? And, and God doesn't in, uh, learn because you read things in the Bible and I cannot get into all of that. Uh, and, it, and you read things like, and, and it, God repented or sometimes looks like God is shocked with what people are doing and, and all of that. And without sounding too academic, uh, in the Bible, there are things that are written to describe God so that we human beings can understand him. And it is called an anthropomorphism. It means that we have used the ways of man to describe the ways of God. But if we use the ways of man to describe the ways of God, it doesn't become, mean that God has become a man. It is just that for us to get a concept of who we, he is, we can only think of him in human terms that's all because who he is there's no way we can understand except we explain it in human terms so sometimes you will see those verses and it will seem like that um, it, it, it is like uh, you know the bible teaches that God knows all things So there is nothing that happens that he didn't know. There is nothing that happens that shocks God. When Adam and Eve sinned, he wasn't surprised because he knew. 
So why did God come acting as if he's surprised? It's, it's like the way uh, we, we are naturally. You know, when the black stars were going to... <laughs> I haven't finished my analogy. <laughs> when the black stars were going to Ivory Coast, all of us knew they will come back. I mean, is there anybody here truly who believes black stars will win the cup? Any real Ghanaian. All of us knew they are going and they are coming. When we saw them wearing their kente, we knew it would just be for one week. We would just come back. So we knew what will happen. But when they, 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 they were knocked out, uh, then we say, oh, what have they done? Oh, what have they done? We are acting surprised. But really, were we surprised? No. So we are acting emotionally, but we already knew it was going to happen. That is a very crude way of explaining God's foreknowledge and God's actions in time. There are things he knows will happen, but when he, it happens, he will feel sad. It's like, a, you know, your, your child comes to you uh, and she says, Mommy, I, I won the first prize or whatever, whatever in the class. Tomorrow is a speech day. I want you to come and, and because I'm going to receive a lot of prizes. Now, you know your daughter is going to receive prizes. But when you go and your daughter receives prizes, you, can, you will sit and say, oh, I knew it. I knew it. She collects the English prize. I knew. Maths. I knew. No. When she wins a prize, you get up as if it's the first time you are hearing it. But you knew it. You knew it. You had foreknowledge. But your actions are appropriate for the time it is happening. Are you, are you getting me? That, that explains God in a sense. He never learns anything. He never improves. He doesn't become better. Some people say the God of the Old Testament was a very, very wicked God. Then maybe as, as God was watching human beings, say, these people are, if I'm not careful, I'll kill all of them. So now I have changed my mind about them. No, he didn't change. He's the same God. He's the same God. His mercy is the same. His love is the same. He didn't become more loving in the New Testament. He didn't become more gracious in the New Testament. He didn't become more, he wasn't more powerful in the old. He's the same God at every time, at all times. God is eternal. Now because God is eternal, you cannot change him. You can't change God. I said you can't change God. Because if you can change God, then the one who can change God has become the God of God. So your prayer can change God. <laughs> It's very important. Your worship cannot change God. Your giving cannot change God. Now, the reason this is important is because, you know, God was God by himself before he created anything. The things he created did not make him God. He was God before he created the things. Are, are you getting me? So, the things he has created, therefore, cannot change him because he was who he was before he created the things. And before he created human beings to have the capacity to worship him, he was God. So, whether you worship him or not, he's God. So, if you decide, I won't worship God, he's God. 
If you decide, I worship God every day, he's God. Your worship or non-worship does not change him. He's an eternal God. Are you following that? He's eternal. Now, the reason I'm saying this is important because it affects prayer. It has a direct impact on prayer when you understand the God of the Bible as eternal. It affects prayer. You say, Pastor, how does it affect prayer? You see, there are, there are gods who need to be sustained. You have to give them food. And when they are hungry and you don't feed them, they will die. You know, sometimes in our traditional settings, they will say something like, an accident has happened somewhere in a, on a bridge. And they will say, this, the God here says he needs blood. That's why he caused the accident so he can drink blood to sustain him. Now, if you're an African and you think that way, then you may also think that our God the God of the Bible also needs to be sustained. And if he needs to be sustained, then the way we do it is come and we bow and we worship him. And when we worship him, he's so happy that whatever we want, he gives it to us. Because God is so happy that we've given him fans. Watch it. Because if you think God can change, it, it, you know, when, when I was a young Christian, I, I was told, people say, you know, when you are worshipping, it's like, you know, you are sitting with your father. He said, daddy, I want a shoe. Or daddy, I want this. And, and daddy doesn't want to buy. Then you go and sit with your father and you clip his nails and you remove his socks for him and you talk to him and he, you give him his best food. And then your father's mind will change and give you the thing. And somehow, anthropomorph <laughs> anthropomorphically, we, we impose it on God and think that the God of the Bible is changeable. So that if I need something I, from now, I'm going to worship every day for 30 days because somehow I need to change God so that God will do this for me. Now, if my worship can change God, I have become God. I have become the God of God because I have the key to change him. If I withdraw worship, he gets jittery. If I give him worship, he is happy. That is not the God of the Bible. It may be the God of your ancestors. It may be the God of other religions. But in Christianity, the God of Christianity does not change. So, somebody says, so then I won't worship again. I won't pray again because it won't change God. No, you have to worship. Because when you worship, it doesn't change God. It changes you and brings you in alignment with God. Are you, are you getting that? Let me, let me use a, a way to illustrate this. If you have every plant... Or most plants, let me say, not say every, most plants need sunlight for photosynthesis to survive. And if they are in the shade, although they, are, they have good soil, they will wither or, or get sickly and probably die. But if the, sun, the plant comes to the sun, it will live. So I want you to imagine God. I'm not saying God is the sun, but I want you to imagine analogically that God is the sun and his rays are shining on the earth and there is a plant that needs the sun but it is in the shade and it is praying God give me sunshine God give me sunshine God give me sunshine God says but you are you are under a rock and sunshine does not bend 
Sunshine will not bend and say, now you pray, the sunshine will now bend and come and come and look up for you and under the rock. No, it won't bend. So as you pray, God gave me sunshine. The only thing God will do to help you to get sunshine is to move you from under the rock into the sunshine. So what prayer does is that it moves you from where you are to the place where God's favor is, God's miracles are, God's favor. God's power is. But as for God, he remains the same. As for God. And that is why it is a fallacy to think that somebody, a human being, can be a dispenser of God. Are you getting me? So that somebody, a human being, can distribute God by his choice. No. No human being has that power. God works by himself. He is unchanging. He does not bend to us. We bend to him. So, the purpose of prayer Is to align you with God's will. Remember the Lord's prayer? He taught us. Our Father. Who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Lead us not. Into temptation. Every prayer, God's will and his leading. God's will and his leading. The purpose of prayer is to bring you into God's will. And the way to get to God's will is through his leading you to where he is flowing and what he is doing. That is why everything is about Christianity is aligning with God's agenda instead of God aligning with your agenda. You don't make up your mind and God backs you. God makes up his mind and we work with his mind. We work with his purposes. And if you learn to pray yourself into God's will, his will will be done in your life on earth as it is in heaven at all times. Because God is immutable he doesn't change he is infinite he does not improve if there's anything I want you to get as a Christian is that that is a God you worship that's a God you worship he's the unchanging one he's not given to change he's infinite he's not improving he's not learning He's not becoming better. We are learning. We are becoming better. We are improving so we can know him and his ways better and be more in his light than in the shade where he's not moving. When we talk about God, there are two big words that are important to understand God. The first one is that God is transcendent. God is transcendent. Transcendent is T-R-A-N-S-C-E-N-D-E-N-T. -E -E God is transcendent. What does it mean? It's, it's very simple. It simply means God exists beyond and outside of all creation. He exists beyond and outside of all his creation. And he does not derive any aspect of his being from outside himself. He does not derive any aspect of his being from outside himself. So, God is beyond his creation. And he does not, nothing about his creation is in him. <laughs> you get nothing about the creation is in God because he was there before the creation so the creation cannot be inside of him 
So you cannot pour water for him to drink. Are you getting it? You cannot pour snaps for him to drink. Because he was God before snaps. Or at Petechi for that matter. He was God before water. You, are, you cannot make otto an egg for him to eat. Because he was there before the otto. He does not derive any aspect of his being from the things he has created. Neither can you pour olive oil for him to drink. Okay, let me leave it there. <laughs> because, you see, the, the reason I'm, I'm teaching this is there are many gods. The God of the Israelites was not the same God as the God of the, of the Egyptians. The God of Abraham was not the same God as the God of the people around there. And because we all came to know this God from our own gods, sometimes we carry images and understanding of our gods and impose them on the God of the Bible. And we want the God of the Bible to function as our God's function. But the God of the God of the Bible is not like any of the gods you know. And he doesn't function there like that. And you cannot impose their ways on God. You know, in most of our traditions, you go to a deity and you can go and summon somebody to the deity and give the deity enough motivation. To kill the person. You give the deity enough motivation. Enough, you know, you hold a bottle of uh, drink here. Hold two, two bottles and hit an egg to the floor. You give the deity a motivation. It will kill somebody, something for you. That is the God you know in your tradition. But this God who was first known as the God of Abraham. And the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and the God of Israel and the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now our God, he is of a different kind. And that's why he told the Israelites, don't learn from any of the nations. Don't copy them. Don't be like them because I am different. And in that, he told them, when it comes to that, I am a jealous God. Not an envious God. There's a difference between envy and jealous. Envy is when you think you have a competitor. Jealous is when you love something so much that you protect it from a destroyer. And he says, I am that jealous God. God is transcendent. Everybody say God is transcendent. But God is not only transcendent. God is immanent. God is immanent. I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T. God is immanent. What that means is simply that God is present and actively working within his creation. So he is not so transcendent that he has left the earth. And you say, whatever happens, it's up to you. No, he is actually working in his creation. He has not abandoned his creation. He has left, not left his creation. He's actively working. And you see that throughout the book of Genesis chapter 1. That God is actively working. He didn't just create and fold the book he created and watches over creation and continues to influence times and seasons in his creation and continues to influence the people that he has created. God is immanent. This is how David describes the immanence of God in Psalm 139 verse 7 
to 12. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Now, the, the, the hell here is Hades. Or Sheol. It's not hellfire. That's not what David is saying. David is saying, if I make my bed in hell, he means if I die, you are there. In other words, God's presence does not leave or God does not lose sight of those who die. He's mindful of them. He's mindful of those who are in his presence. He's mindful of heaven. He's mindful of the dead. You cannot escape God. Even the, he says, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. What David is saying, and in those days they didn't have spaceships, but if they had spaceships, I'm sure he would have said, if I take a rocket and go to the moon, you are there. And if I go beyond the moon to Mars, even there you are there. And if I go to Jupiter, you are still there. And if I go beyond Jupiter and I go to Uranus, you are there. And if I go uh, to Saturn, you are there. And if I go from there to Uranus, you are there. And if I go to Neptune, you are there. If I go to good old little Pluto who has been demoted, you are still there. And if I go beyond the solar system, you are there. If I go beyond the galaxy, you are there. What David is saying is there is no place in the created order where God's presence is not felt. No place. That shows you how present God is. He's a present God. When all your friends leave you, he's there. When you are abandoned in the middle of the sea, he's there. When you are caught in a cave, he's there. There is no place where the presence of God cannot be in the created order. And that is why, because he's there, you can call on him from any point where you are. You can call him. We come to church not because when we call on God here, it is more powerful. Are you getting it? We come to church, not, not because when we come here to pray, the presence of God is at this altar. If you, it, the, 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 there's, there's whatever the people teach. No. That may be the gods of your ancestors who are all localized God and they are localized in an object you have to have a localized object you have to build a mound you have to do something for the for the idol or the God to localize and 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 indwell and be kept in a local place that is why you go to your village the gods are many. There is no town with one god. The gods are many. The many localized. And my god is not your god. And that's why they fight. So I can talk to my god. To hit you stick. Hit you stick. <laughs> So I can tell my God, hit him with a stick <laughs> because he doesn't belong to you. Hit him with a stick. But this God who created the heavens and the earth, all men and women belong to him. So you cannot tell him, 
to hit somebody with a stick for him to do it because he is the creator of all people. Are you following? That's the God of the Bible. That's the God of the Bible. Wherever we are, when we call on him, he hears. If one day somebody goes to build an earth colony on Mars, as Elon Musk wants to do, God will still be there. And when they call on him on Mars, he will hear. If you go to live on Jupiter, is there, if it's ever possible for you to live under gas and pray, God will hear you. If you are in outer space and you say, Heavenly Father, he will hear you because you cannot escape his presence anywhere in the created universe. He is immanent, he is present everywhere. And he's present not everywhere, but at every time. Sometimes we call him the ancient of days. It is a limited terminology because it's a human way of saying God has been there for a long time. But it doesn't mean that he has accumulated age ah, and now God is old. And so he's called ancient of days. This is just human description of God. But he's eternal. He's there forever. Now, when God revealed himself in the Bible, people had to learn about him because other people were worshiping their gods. So then they would do something that they do for their God, for this God. And he would say, I hate it, don't do it. And then they would do something else. And he says, I, don't, I hate it, don't do it. So they had to learn what does God like and what, does it, what fits him and what doesn't fit him. Because there are things they do for their gods that they think if they do for Jehovah God, he will like. That was the big problem of Israel. You know, sometimes we judge them too harshly. But can you imagine the entire world? The entire world has a certain notion of gods and I don't know, all, all kinds of things. And you are the only people on the whole earth who believe this God we are talking about. You go to another village, they are doing something else. You go to another village, they are doing something else. You go to somewhere, they say, well, if you want to receive power, go and talk to the dead. Go and bring the dead and talk to dead people and they will give you revelation and all of that. And, and, and they are doing all kinds of things. And so God had to now warn Israel specifically what they must not do if they want to worship him. Because the ways of the other gods is not the way of the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is unique, is distinct from every other notion of God. And as Christians, our number one obligation is to know whom we worship. You remember when Paul went to Athens and he started talking to them on Mars Hill. He says, I was walking through town and you have all kinds of gods here. And I actually saw one with the inscription to an unknown God. Then he says, whom you do not know, that's the one I declare to you. Now, a lot of Christians are worshiping an unknown God. We are using the name of Jesus all right. We are meeting in churches all right. Even pastors are propagating a God that is distinctly not the God of the Bible. And they are making claims that is not in conformity with the God of the Bible. 
And sometimes we make statements. God will change his mind concerning you. I understand where it is coming from. I understand the ignorance. I understand, you know, because ma many times people say, but it's in the Bible. We don't just say because something is in the Bible, it is that. You have to understand the context under which it is written because the Bible is very consistent with itself and not contradictory. The doctrine of God is clear, uncontradictory, and error-proof. God cannot be schizophrenic. He cannot be a God who is eternal and a God who changes his mind at the same time. If he changes his mind, he's not eternal. Are you, are you getting me? If he changes his mind, he's not eternal. If he changes his mind, he's not infinite. If something happens he didn't know, he's not infinite. That is why I tell people who, I won't call them prophets, but who say things. I, people who say, I think, you know, as, as a person myself, when I was growing up as a Pentecostal, one of the things that is normative to, to Pentecostalism is that the Holy Spirit told me, God told me, God spoke to me, the Lord spoke to me, the Lord said, and I understand the culture. I, it was what birthed me. I said that many times. But at a certain point, I said, let me be careful. Because if the mind changes, Lest people think God has changed his mind. Let me say, at this point, this is how I sense it. So that when it changes, I'll say, I was wrong. But I, if it doesn't happen, I cannot come and say, God changed his mind. Then I am undermining the eternality of God. <laughs> I, are you getting me? I'm undermining the eternality of God. And the infiniteness of God. Because people are going to impute my mistake on God. Because I said, God told me. So just let us be humble and say, this is what I'm sensing. I feel strongly about this. I've prayed about this. This is what I feel strongly about. Just let there be a margin of error. Because for everything human, there is a margin of error. And the margin of error is not divine. The margin of error is not divine. The margin of error is always human. So I must bear the human margin of error so that we let God be God. Because if we don't do that, then those of us who speak in his name undermine him at the same time. Because sometimes people say, uh, God told me, blaster, will come with a, with a cup. <laughs> and then, and then, and then, uh, <laughs> I don't know whether we saw the cup or not, you know. <laughs> Maybe, maybe we were like uh, Moses. Our eyes saw it, but it was far away. And then later, black star coming home. Then you, you come and say, yeah, I said it, but God changed his mind. Please, please, just say at that point, this is how I sense it. And I said it. I think I made a mistake. Because obviously, they are back home. So, what I received, obviously, was not God. But when you put God in the docket, you are undermining him, undermining his nature, and undermining the faith of people in him. So you can say whatever you want to say. You can say whatever you say, but qualify it as how you are sensing it. 
And, you know, if we are humble, we ourselves will learn. And very soon you will know that anytime I eat wache in the evening, I have this kinds of revelation. Anytime I eat wache. This kind of revelation that doesn't come to pass. Anytime I eat wache. Every time I eat wache in the night. If I eat past 8.30, I start seeing all these kinds of things, hearing these voices. So now you learn from your mistake and decide, I will stop eating after 8.30 and see what kind of thing I will get. So gradually you improve your receptivity to what God is telling you. But if you don't have the humility to adjust your ways, then you continue. You know, sometimes the boldness of people who declare falsehood, they are so bold and brazen. I say, what kind of, where did this audacity come from? You have made a terrible mistake that is self-evident. You can't fry it anywhere. Except to say, it wasn't God who said it. It wasn't even God who revealed it to me. I saw something. I thought it was God. I have said it. And it's a mistake. And you learn and improve on your ways. Because you can learn to hear God better. You can learn to sense his presence better. You can learn all of this. Because human beings improve. Samuel had to hear the voice of God three times. And even then he couldn't improve. And he had to be instructed. That this time when it happens, say so and so and so and so. In other words, the, you, you can improve the way you understand and receive from God. But don't make yourself God. Don't make yourself. And to every preacher, don't make yourself God. You are just a human being, please. I've heard some people say, if I be a man of God. You know, because sometimes we, we read the Bible, we read the words, but we don't understand what it's saying. You see, if you read somebody like Elijah, you have to understand that the only people who knew this God of the Bible was Israel. That's all. So when Israel goes into apostasy and they are worshiping idols, it means nobody knows this God. So then God has to raise one man and he calls, the, he calls the God of Elijah. Why? Because the Israelites have abandoned God. Everybody has abandoned God. And so only Elijah, supposedly, later he found there were 7,000, is now speaking for God. So if I be a man of God, can be said by people in a time when a whole generation have gone apostate and only one person stands between God and the rest of humanity. At that time, that person is very unique. For you to, to, to particularize God to you, it means the whole earth has backslided. All Christians in Ghana, in Nigeria, Burkina Faso, everywhere. They've backslided. Ivorians have backslided. European Christians, they've backslided. And then, you know, South America, everybody has backslided. American, everybody has backslided. Nobody knows God. And at this point in history, you are the only one who knows God. Then you can particularize and say, the God of so and so, because all of us have backslidden. But I don't think we have all backslidden. <laughs> so you cannot say that. And you cannot even say, if I be a man of God, what if it doesn't happen? I've, I've talked to people. One day somebody was having a chat with me. He said, he told me something that was going to happen. And I said, okay. You know, I don't take a stock in that. I don't need to know what people know of the future. I just know the one who knows the future. I trust him. He'll guide my future. But anyway, so we're going to have a, an event. And this guy says, I'm telling you, it will not rain. Rain is something you don't have to play with. <laughs> if I'll give you, I don't play with rain. 
Because the, the, the atomic systems in the atmosphere, they have a mind of their own. They are obeying different laws. So don't play with it. So he said it won't rain. So I said yes. And then he told me, Pastor, I'm telling you, if I be a man of God, it won't rain. The next day. <laughs> it rained like nobody's business. We were going to have Greater Works Conference at the Independence School. That day we all sat in the rain. The day before somebody told me, if I be a man of God, it will rain. It, the rain whipped us. And I was looking for him. Man of God, where are you? Come and answer. You can simply say, Pastor, we really need a good weather. And we're, we're going to talk to God about this. And I trust God that it will not rain. Now, if it rains, you can't be blamed for it. But if you raise the stakes so high, if I am a man of God, Lord, show that you are my servant. So if it doesn't happen, what are you? Are you the devil's servant? When God revealed himself to Moses, it was a very special time. Now remember, in the whole world, the only people who know the God of the Bible is Israel. And at this time, all of Israel is in Egypt. And all of them have become idol worshippers, worshipping the gods of the Egyptians. They've been there for 430 years. They've forgotten the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So Moses goes to Mount Horeb. He himself, he's a recently converted Egyptian. <laughs> you know, he's learned about God, but you know, I mean, he, he used to be in Pharaoh's camp and he was mighty in the acts of the Egyptians. So, I mean, he, he's learning. So he goes to Mount Horeb and he sees a tree that is burning and the leaves are not burning there's fire on it leaves are not burning and he says wow what is this let me go and see so he goes there and he hears a voice and the voice tells him take off your sandals and so and so and so forth he says who are you and the voice describes himself and he says I'm sending you to go to Egypt and go and tell your people, my people, that I've heard their voice and that I've come to deliver them. And Moses said, so what should I say? Who, what name? If they say, who sent me? Who, who, who should I say sent me? And he says, when you go, tell them I am. I am. A year, I am has sent you. I am what? <laughs> I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, what Abraham worship, the one he worship is the one talking to you. The one Isaac worship is the one talking to you. The one Jacob worship is the one talking to you. Interestingly, he didn't say the God of Moses. Because God is saying what you have known historically is what is happening presently at this time. It doesn't mean every man of God must have a God. The God of Obing, the God of Otabel, the God of Kapong, the God of this, the God, the altar of Otabel. If you talk this and you are going back into idolatry, Back into back back to old base. What does I am means? It's a very interesting Hebrew tense that fully translated should be I was, I am, will be. I was, I am, will be. I was, I am, will be. 
In other words, in eternity, I am. In the present, I am. In the future, I am. God has no past, present, and future. Past, present, and future is for human beings. But God has no yesterday. And he has no tomorrow. He is. There is no period of time behind God. And there is no period of time in front of God. For us human beings, there is a period of time ahead of us. Next hour is ahead of me. Tomorrow is ahead of me. Next year is ahead of me. Next 10 years is ahead of me. For God, there is nothing ahead of him. Yesterday is behind me. Last year is behind me. You know, 1979 is behind me. For God, there is nothing behind him. There is no time period behind God. No time period in front of God. Every time is now. And he says, go and tell them, I don't belong to Abraham. I don't belong to Isaac. I don't belong to Jacob. I am myself. I am myself. I am who I am. I am that I am. I am where I am. I am what I am. Whether you are talking about what, a where, or how, I am how I am. I am who I am. I am, whether you're talking about time, he is everything. As the God of the Bible. And if you would notice as you read the Bible, from then, Israel stops talking about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. They minimize it, and eventually it goes out of circulation. Because whom Abraham talked about, they know. Whom Isaac talked about, they know. Whom Jacob talked about, they know. The God they worship is not different from what Isaac, Jacob, and Abraham worship. And that is the God you and I worship. The God you worship is not different from the God of Abraham. It's not different from the God of Isaac. Not different from the God of Jacob. That is why in Christianity, we don't talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We can only use this in reference to express the continuity of our faith. But if you read the New Testament, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ is the God we have come to believe in. He's our God. And God does not want us to know him through somebody else. He wants us to know him directly. That is why when God wanted to save us, he didn't send somebody else. He came himself. He came himself. Not an angel, not an archangel, not a man of God. He came himself because he doesn't want anything blocking you and him. He wants each one of us to behold him with open face. To love him and to worship him directly without any barrier, without any limitation. That is the God of the Bible. And if he is our God. We remember that he's always present. God is never absent. Nothing can take him away. He's present in our moments of pain. He's present in our moment of suffering. He's present when we are happy and joyful. He's present when we are sad. He's present when we are lonely. He's present when we are loved. He's present when we are in the darkness. He's present when we are in the light. He's present when we are in the mountain. He's present when we are in the valley. Nothing takes away his presence from us in Christ Jesus. That's why Paul could boldly say, to be absent in the flesh is to be present with the Lord. There is no time when the Christian is absent from God. There's no period when the Christian is absent from God. In life, 
you are with him. In death, you are with him. There is no time gap when you lose God or God loses you. He's an ever-present God. He's not an absentee God. And he never changes. Times will change. Seasons will change. Friends will change. Your body will change. But God never changes. It doesn't mean that every prayer of yours will be answered. There will be prayers of yours which will not be answered. It will not be answered. Not that God hates you, but it won't be answered. Nobody's going to get 100% prayer answered. There are people who say, as for me, my prayer never miss. You sure? You sure your prayer never miss? Then pray that you live forever. And see whether it will miss or not. <laughs> There are prayers, some prayers that will never be answered. But whether your prayer is answered or not, he's God. Whether your needs are met or not, he's God. Whether you get a husband or you don't get a husband, he's God. Whether you get a baby or you don't get a baby, he's God. Whether you are broke or you are rich, he's God. That's how Job understood God. So when he lost everything, what Job went through, and he still believed God was with him, that's crazy. Because if you attach God's presence to things, and when the things leave you, you think God has left you. If you attach God's presence to blessings, then when the blessings are not there, you think God is not there. But if you attach God's presence to God, then you know that nothing shall separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. 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 Neither height, nor death, nor things to come, nor things present, nor principalities and powers. Nothing can make God absent from you. He's present with you. He is with you. He has not abandoned you. He has not left you. And I like how Job puts it. In all of this, he says, I know he lives. I know my Redeemer lives. What is he saying? I know he's present. He's not absent. He hasn't died. He hasn't slept like the gods of the heathen who goes to sleep sometimes or eats and gets tired and takes a siesta. He neither slumbers nor sleep. I know my God lives. But, but, but everything has gone bad about you. But he lives. But you lost everything. He lives. But you've lost all of your money. He lives. That was the faith of Job. Because he understood the eternal God is my God. And that's what I just want to encourage you with. The God we worship is not the God of the heathen who get tired, who get weary, who get frustrated, and who sometimes will cause accidents to drink blood. Who needs to be appeased? That's not the God of the Bible. And when he needed to be appeased because of our sin, he appeased himself by himself. He appeased himself by himself because nobody is competent enough to appease God. He's the only one who can appease himself. God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world unto himself. There is nothing beyond him. There is nothing that he needs. And this evening we want to just remember this God. And we want to just worship him. Not because we need a breakthrough. But I don't know about you. Any B 
being like that, I don't even need to be told to worship. You worship him naturally because he's awesome. He's great. He's mighty. There is none like him. He creates all things. He oversees all things. He's never taken a nap for billions and billions and quintillions of years. Forever and ever he is God. He's never taken a rest. And this evening we want to stand up. Joe, can you help me a bit? Just lift up your hands to God. Don't ask him for anything. Don't ask him for anything. Just begin to declare your praise to him and your worship of him and your oh, adoration of be him. Lifted above all other God. Oh, we and worship.